I think the Bible is brilliant in psychology, and I want to turn to Genesis chapter 12 and talk about the story and the relationship of Abraham and Sarah. We're talking about someone who didn't have a voice. And in this particular story, it appears that Sarah doesn't have a voice. I'm going to read the scripture, starting in Genesis 12. God says to Abraham, leave your country. And then he says in verse 2, and I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will dishonor, and those who dishonor you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Again in Genesis chapter 12, a few verses later, Abraham now has gone to the land of Canaan, and he actually sees the Lord. God appears to him. And in verse 7, it says, The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. I mean, this, is, this is a personal visitation. But just three verses later, we find Abraham and Sarah are going to Egypt. There is a famine in the land. And I start in verse 10. I'm going to read this passage, and then we'll discuss it. Now, there was a famine in the land, so Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was severe in the land. When he was about to enter Egypt, he said to Sarai, his wife, I know that you are a woman beautiful in appearance. And when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but they will let you live. Say you are my sister, that it may go well with me because of you, and that my life may be spared for your sake. When Abram entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful. And when, the princes of, and when the princes of Pharaoh saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh. And the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And for her sake, he dealt well with Abram. And he had sheep and oxen, male donkeys, male servants, female servants, female donkeys and camels. But the Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. So Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister, so that I took her for my wife? Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. Wow, that is a powerful passage. I want to unpack it a little bit for you. Let's take a little bit of a play-by-play. -play. Let's start out talking about Abram and Sarah. And I'll call them Abraham and Sarah versus Abram and Sarai. Their names are changed a few chapters later. They are brother and sister. They have the same father, but not the same mother. So Abram and his two brothers are the children of his father's first wife. But Sarah is the child of either another wife, a concubine, probably a very beautiful woman because Sarah is very beautiful. But you have to catch something. She likely doesn't have the same status as Abram. And I think that's going to factor in here. We're trying to figure out why Sarah goes along with this plan and says, yeah, I'm his sister. So Sarah marries her big brother. He's 10 years older than her. What age do you think they probably got married? If you were parents and you had a household and there were these two that had an attraction, the parents probably would pick that up before they were very old, 
I'm assuming Abram was probably, let's say, 25. Maybe Sarah was 15. Somewhere in there. At the time of this story, Sarah's 65 and Abram's 75. So plus or minus 50 years they have been married. This is not just a short-term relationship. When siblings fight, how does that go? It can be pretty tough. When a married couple fights, how, how does that go? Well, that can be pretty tough. When you combine those two, you potentially have some real fights. You potentially have some real stress in a relationship. Another factor that comes into play here is Sarah's beauty. Beautiful women typically have high expectations, and people have high expectations of beautiful women. The fact that Sarah has not been able to have a child for plus or minus 50 years, how is that landing on her? How is she feeling about herself? You know, it's interesting that all of the patriarchs' wives, it says of Sarah, of Rebecca, and of Rachel, they were all beautiful. And if you'll notice, they were all barren. Sarah for 50, 60 years, probably. Rebecca for 20 years, and Rachel for a number of years. I wonder if there's a connection between this power of beauty and the ability for you to control your own life. It's almost as if God sort of builds in a bit of a handicap so that, that the beautiful person, this incredible gift, he doesn't give it to everyone, but so it doesn't destroy you, it seems that he builds in a bit of a handicap so that they need to come to him. So Abraham sees some danger. He's heard some stories of what happens to men, to the husbands of beautiful women, and he is convinced that this is going to happen to him. And he comes up with a strategy. Look, we're going to go down there. They're going to see you're beautiful. And obviously this has happened every place they have gone. Everywhere they go, people stare at Sarah. So he knows it's going to happen in Egypt. And when it does... He's going to be killed, and they're going to take her into someone's harem. But if he plays his cards right, and she says, you're my sister, well, she's probably going to go into a harem anyway, but he'll get to arrange the harem that she goes into. And what would she feel like if she, if he got killed and there she was in someone's harem, and she could have prevented it. Imagine the guilt that Sarah is going to feel if she could have prevented this, but she doesn't. Abram is a brilliant strategist. I mean, come on. I mean, take one for the team. I mean, we're all in this together. Interesting role reversal. Instead of, I'm going to protect you, my wife, I need you to protect me. Sacrifice yourself to save me. I wonder what Abraham's reaction was to, to Sarah the day they came to get her. I mean, think with me what that would have been like. I mean, was he, I mean, did he kiss her goodbye? Did he um, wave, maybe shake hands with her, pat her on the back? Oh, you forgot your cosmetic case? I mean, wh wh what was his reaction when it was time to go? 
these are real people. This is a real situation. And what was her reaction? How did she feel as she, she'd been married 50 or so years, all of a sudden she's now going to be the wife of another man? Oh, and she doesn't speak Egyptian. Oh, that, oh but you know, that's not a problem. He, Pharaoh doesn't want her for conversation, does he? Not for her quick wit. That's not why he's coming to get her. You know, one of the things that we often don't consider is that in that period of time, I mean, nobody leaves a harem alive. I mean, we, most of us know the story. She comes out of the harem. In fact, she goes into another harem a little bit later and comes out of that one. I mean, it's as if this were, you know, women coming and going like it was a day spa. I mean, this is not a day spa. This, nobody gets out of there alive. Abraham is never going to see his wife again. Oh, but he does. The plague comes on Pharaoh, and out she comes. But I wonder what kind of damage this did to his relationship. I checked with my wife on what kind of damage that would do to a relationship, and she assured me it would do a lot of damage to a relationship. You are supposed to protect me. Isn't that what a husband does? What is, what is this role reversal? How does that play out? And what was it like for the two of them at the dinner table the night Sarah comes out of the harem? Oh, that's an uncomfortable dinner. I mean, what does Abraham say? I mean, did they feed you well? I mean, mm. did you get a room with a view? Mm. Um, you know, we missed you around here. <laughs> not, not, mm. Just not the same with you around. Mm. Wow. Ouch. Ouch. And guess who's serving them dinner? Oh, it's one of the female servants that Abraham received in exchange for his wife, Hagar. Or Hagar, people say, but Hagar is her, uh, her Hebrew or Egyptian name. There she was, serving them dinner, and she'll fit into the story a little bit later. Wow. What does say you are my sister mean to Abraham? Well, it means survival. It means business. I mean, everyone agrees I'm the most important person in this family. So you need to do what you can to save me, to preserve me. That's what we're here for. In other words, you can't live without me. I mean, does Abraham really appreciate her? Well, he actually does it again and does great damage to this relationship. And what does say you are my sister mean to Sarah? What does say you are my sister mean to her? Because we know that when men are speaking and women are speaking, often they're hearing two different things. Abraham thinks this is a, a brilliant strategy, uh, and my wife and probably Sarah think it's not a brilliant strategy. It's a rather foolish strategy. It will destroy your family. It will tear away the fiber of your relationship. I mean, to Sarah, it means I'm, I'm, I'm property. It means I haven't been able to have a child. Oh, by the way, if Sarah had been able to have a child, would she have had to participate in this charade? Don't think so. Ouch. If I had had a child, I would not have to pretend that I'm single and available. Wow. Low self-esteem. Shame. I remember in my mother's family, they had this saying, what's your excuse for living? 
I mean, Sarah's just taking up resources, or so she feels, or so she's made to feel. I believe she loves Abraham. She's always loved Abraham. She's only ever loved Abraham. And she's doing what she believes she needs to do to make him love her. Oh, how we go astray trying to help people or make people love us. I mean, what will be Abraham's reaction if she refuses? If she says no? Will it be anger? Will she get the cold shoulder? Will he start needling her about her barrenness? What was the dynamics of this relationship going into this situation in Egypt? Can you relate? Can you relate to having pressure put on you to go along with someone else's agenda? that you knew was not right for you, it was not in your best interests, it was not honoring to God, and it was going to be destructive to your relationship. I think we can all relate. Loaning money to a narcissistic person in need could be a child, could be a someone in the family, but they are insisting that you have to help them. And if you don't, you are going to be a bad person. Perhaps giving time and attention to a problem that doesn't have your name on it. 